we took the generation of the apostles and we said how all the apostles were evangelists and uh, they all were martyred and we had how the New Testament was written and the era of its writing and how it was collected and we also had uh, the heresies that happened during the first and second centuries. We heard about something called apostolic fathers, the generation after the apostles, and we heard about the uh, apologetic fathers uh, who defended faith against the Romans and we had an idea about the holy tradition, the, the holy tradition the, and how it was uh, collected from old uh, books. We also had how the New Testament was canonized as 27 books. Nothing can be added for, uh, to them or deducted from them. And we took the 10 uh, first stages of Roman persecution into the world. Slide 9, right? We had from starting from Neron and after Christ immediately to the time of the Cletian, who uh, at that time was the most violent period of time in persecuting Christians, and then Constantine came. And then we said the Coptic Church is considered to be the mother of martyrs, or the church that mostly was exposed because of the time of martyrdom was continuous, and it, uh, she had times where there were a lot of martyrs, huge numbers of martyrs. Then we go to something called the assemblies. Uh, oh, every Orthodox should understand and study this point because it affects our life till now. What are the assemblies, the uh, ecumenical assemblies, and what is their role in history and uh, influence on our prayers till now? The first assembly is that of Nicaea. Nicaea uh, assembly happened in the year 325 AD. At that time, the Pope of Alexandria, that was the 19th Pope, named uh, Pope Alexandrus. He was a kind and blessed man. And he had a disciple called Athanasius. He was not yet a Pope. And uh, before that, there was a priest of, from Libya, but he lived in Alexandria. His name was Arian. He was an Orthodox Coptic priest, but it started to be philosophical and say that Jesus Christ is not equal to the Father. He's not of the same essence of the Father. We can consider him an intermediate God between man and God the Father, and so he denied the Holy Trinity. And Of course, uh, the Pope Alexander was strict with him at the beginning, and it was said he uh, banned him for a time and then he accepted him and then Arian had relations outside Egypt so his ideas started to spread and because he used to give to say poetry and uh, and uh, he had famous sermons people started to be affected by him and uh, his sermons uh, reached some other countries so the matter needed that all the world popes would resist this heresy so they decided to meet in Nicaea in the year 325 AD, that was the first assembly after the end of persecution era. If you remember, this could not happen if the Cletian was alive, but when Constantine was there and the churches started to quiet, the devil started to play another game other than persecution to ruin the church from inside, to, to confuse people's minds. So in uh, Arian stood in the assembly talking about his ideas. So the deacons and Athanasius at that time uh, started to answer the thoughts. And because Athanasius, two or three years before his father, St. Alexander, gave him a homework to copy the Gospel of John, there was no printing. So he copied tens of copies, uh, wrote tens of copies of the Gospel of John. And you all know the Gospel of John is the most that has proofs, uh, evident proofs about the divinity of Christ. Many verses, me and the Father are one and uh, all and so on. So when Arian started to have verses to interpret them in his way, he found Athanasius giving him double the number of verses to confirm the church teaching that Christ is of the same essence of the Father or equal to the Father in the essence the 318 bishops agreed to um, stop Arian and to put the decree of faith. This is why till now the decree of faith, they call it the decree of Nicene faith or the decree of Athanasius uh, uh, 
decree because those who study they know that there are other decrees of faith before or after because the word decree it means a, a faith uh, phrasing like uh, phrasing of faith the faith is one but phrasing it like uh, making the sign of the cross is a decree of faith when I say in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit the one God that way I said a phrasing of faith see so the, dec the Nicene decree of faith had a great echo because all bishops agreed to it. It used to start, truly, really, we believe in one, and it would end with the word, yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit. Because there were no problems except about the divinity of the Son. This is why this part, most of the, time, most of the words were about Christ. At the beginning, you know the decree of faith in the one God, the God, the Father, the Pantocrator, creator of heaven and earth, then, then we find words about our Lord Jesus Christ, like Lemsi, that confirms the divinity and work of Christ that was the issue of the fourth century. At that time, if you want, in a, there were three teams, uh, the Orthodox team, the all the world followed at that time, the Orthodox, straightforward, they believe that the Logos, who is Christ, glory be to him, is eternal. The, the Father, the Word, the Son, the Word, even before incarnation, was born from the Father before all ages. While Arian said, no, the Logos is not eternal. And he uh, used a verse from the Proverbs, the, but in the same chapter there is a response to that. The Eusebian team, they were in the middle, of, uh, influenced by Arian. They agreed a little bit, but they had things that confused them. The most clear thing that was confusing, the son is of the same essence of the father. That's our dogma, that the father and the son are one essence, one divinity. When we say humanity is uh, one essence, one nature. Someone has glasses, we have women, we have men, we have old, we have young, but at the end of the day we are all body and blood. We are one nature. So the essence or the nature for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is one nature. <coughs> Arian said no, the essence of the Son is different from that of the Father. Eusebian said something in the middle, he said similar. The essence of the Son is similar. Of course, Athanasius and the whole church stood and said, no, we have to confirm that it is the same essence of the Father, because if Christ is not a true God, then the salvation that he did wouldn't get to all people. If he is not a true God, then the effectiveness of his redemption, how can it cover humanity or cover time if he is a limited human being? That's why because the difference is one letter in the Greek between the Orthodox and the people of Eusebius. So they say the whole fourth century, the problem was about one letter. Is it equal or similar? It's equal. That's what we say right now. But as Jehovah Witnesses, they still follow the words of Arian and Eusebius. They say he's different or similar, but not the same essence of the Father. Then after that, Actually, Arian was, did not stop because he wanted to uh, succeed. He started to convince the emperors after Constantine with his thought. So that when the emperor who ruled the world was influenced by Arian, then the Athanasius was bad. So Athanasius started to be exiled and because they considered him to be troublesome for the church. See, when the facts are switched, the <coughs> earthly... Uh, uh, king does this all the time when the emperor followed Arian so the church of Egypt led by Athanasius was the problem. Athanasius was exiled for five times for his defense for the dogma. So Athanasius uh, stayed for a long time uh, as a pope more than 50 years he was ordained 28 years old, so he stayed as a pope for a long time. But he was exiled outside Egypt. He didn't stay a lot for uh, in Alexandria. He went a lot to Upper Egypt. At that time, St. Anthony was famous 
and he had strong monasticism and he had thousands of monks. They all supported Saint Pope Athanasius. And so monasticism, Egyptian monasticism, was responsible for the defense of the Orthodox faith. So not only Athanasius, but the monks of Egypt and priests of Egypt and all the Coptic people were ready and not, uh, not to uh, give up the Orthodox faith. This is all very important history because every time when we say truly we believe in one God, we want to hear how great these things are. Without them, the whole world would have been confused. Now the theologians who teach theology in all the uh, Catholic and Protestant institutes, they know this, infor this information. They say if it was not Athanasius in Egypt, the Christian faith would have been uh, deviated and everyone would, be, would belong to Jehovah Witnesses now. <coughs> it's because of the Copts and Saint Athanasius. I will say something another, uh, else about the second assembly. We say the 30, 318 in Nicaea and 150 in Constantinople. What these assemblies, they were too just to agree, and that's it. If there is no dogmatic problem, the church goes on. And when I say the church, when I would think the church in the whole world, Europe had churches, Asia, Africa, all the ancient world had Christians, and Christians were kind of like half of the population. Then came someone else, his name was Macedonius. Macedonius was, he said words that confused, not about Christ, like the dogma about the divinity of Christ was a staple because of the first assembly and Athanasius defense. But Macedonius, he started to say that the Holy Spirit is an energy, just an energy. But it cannot, we cannot consider him to be like the Father and the Son. That's his opinion. The church never said that. So he started, uh, the church started to worry about this because if the Holy Spirit is just an energy, then how can we become, uh, how can we participate with the divine nature and how can we be temples for the Holy Spirit and how come the Bible would say, do not sadden the Spirit of God. Would that be an energy? If, uh, would electricity be sad if it's just an energy? But he is a person, a person, an entity, like a person, a true one. And the Holy Spirit dwelled upon Christ uh, on Theophany, the, uh, Epiphany. So it's not just an energy. He's not an energy. When we take the Holy Spirit in Meron, he, he dwells in us, in his spirit. So Macedonius, of course, he saw himself like uh, all the heretics. He didn't like that. So they had to um, make a council or an assembly uh, in Constantinople, 300, uh, the year 381. Three, uh, instead of 318, you can change the number 381, 381. The one before was in 325 AD, and the other one, like almost 60 years between the two councils, as Saint Athanasius was already uh, like departed to heaven. The emperor Theodosius was a good person, so he couldn't. Uh, talk about dogmatic things, he said, sit down and teach us what's wrong. Just agree. Tell us what Christ, what did Christ mean by is the Holy Spirit energy or a person? The one who stood in that council was St. Timothy, the 22nd Pope. Athanasius is the 20th Pope, so one of his disciples, St. Timothy, Pope Timothy, uh, stood in the um, council defending the dogma of the Holy Spirit, but one of the heroes of that uh, council was Saint Gregory, the theologian, when who we pray his divine liturgy, uh, Saint Gregory of Nazianza. He was contemporary of, and he has uh, many sermons about the divinity of the Holy Spirit. He's like Athanasius in defending the divinity of the Son. Gregory was in defending the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So when they found that uh, it had to be, it has to be documented, they said, let us add to the degree of faith. So we started to hear, yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord. So we canceled energy. He's a person now. So the Holy Spirit is Lord, Christ is the Lord and the Father is the Lord. They are not separate uh, ones, but three in one. The 
life giving from the Father, we worship Him because He's not energy. If He's an energy, we wouldn't worship Him. But as a true God, we worship Him and we glorify Him with the Father and the Son. The prophets prophesied about the Holy Spirit, so they continued about the decree of faith in the year 381 AD, and all the bishops represented the churches of the world, and they all agreed and signed, and they all agreed that they will say that in their churches. Till now, we have there was nothing called sects. They were not they were not talking one language, but they came from all over the world. But they all, as Christians preserved the faith and the dogma that they were handed over from the early church and the holy tradition they were all talking the same language in that sense then we have uh, we are in the last council just three minutes i'll finish this part the council of ephesus uh, ephesus council like the church was stable and we say truly we believe in one god and we wait for the resurrection of the dead 60 years later we come to the year 400 or 50 years, 431 uh, AD. At that time, Theodosius the, the Young, so the, the second, not the first Theodosius, there was an uh, archbishop called Nastur from Constantinople. Nastur, he was like a knife because he divided Christ into two. He said, Jesus is God to respond to Arian. But sometimes he is a man. See the confusion? So Christ is some, sometimes a God, sometimes a man. When he was born, he was just a human. Then after that, he became our Lord. And then when he sleeps, he becomes a man. And when he eats, he's a man. When he does a miracle, he's God. When he was crucified, he was a man. Of course, what is this confusion? It was confusing. Would we look to him as what? One, two different natures, separate natures. Of course, Pope uh, Cyril was the disciple of the disciple of the disciple of Athanasius. He was the 24th Pope. Alexander 19, Athanasius 20, Timothy uh, 22, and then Cyril uh, the Great 24. Pope Cyril the Great sent him letters my brother, because they are brothers, popes like each other. We were not handed over that. And by the way, it started with a sermon on Christmas. Nastor said there were no recordings. However, it reached Egypt at that time. I am wondering how, why would the Maggies worship that baby Jesus? They should only worship the Lord. See the confusion? So immediately, St. Cyril told him, Jesus, the baby Jesus is the Lord because the first says the holy is born from you will be called the son of God so it's a holy baby and he is called the son of God he didn't like that of course he was not expecting that Egypt will or Alexandria will correct for him because what is Alexandria to Constantinople the pride interferes with that he kept teaching and spreading his ideas till they agreed there must be an, a council like so he was a pope uh, so it's more dangerous than even Arian so when they sat down and uh, Cyril the Great was a famous saint in the church he was the hero of the council like Athanasius in Nicaea uh, Cyril here was a hero because he had an evidence and he was looked at as the teacher of the whole world so those who attended were 200 so this is why we say the 150 in Constantinople and 200 in Ephesus so they rep those 200 represented the ch world churches at that time uh, there were anathemas at that time even that exists in, in Galatians in the language of the Bible it's someone who is uh, abolished, banned so Nastur was anathema and those who participated in his teaching because they are dangerous to the church so the problem was Christ was one person or two they agreed he's one person one or nature of two he has the humanity and divinity his divinity did not depart from his humanity for one moment or a twinkle of an eye see we all memorize it now easily that phrasing it was made 
during the era of Pope Cyril the Great, and we say it as we say our Father who art in heaven. We all memorize it so that we understand that Christ is always God and always man. The divinity didn't abolish humanity or humanity didn't abolish divinity without mingling and mixing or changing, altering. The divinity remained divinity and humanity remained humanity, but it's a true uh, unity, but they didn't mix or alter. But Christ had all the features of divinity and humanity except for sin. The problem here was that Nastur refused to call St. Mary the mother of the holy or the mother of God or the mother of light. Why? Because he called her the mother of Jesus. Because he was convinced that Jesus originally he was just a baby who was born and became God later. So immediately St. Cyril insisted that we, we have to call St. Mary the Theotokos, the mother of God meaning Theotokos means the mother of God and who will not agree to that uh, epithet will be following Nastur. So all bishops agreed because they understand and that who was born from St. Mary the incarnate Lord and St. Mary was not the beginning of his divinity, certainly not. His certainty, his divinity goes back to the Father but he was born from the Father before all ages but he was born and incarnate from St. Mary that's how we got the praises and the hymn of through, uh, through the intercession of the Mother of God. All this was made during the 5th century. What we say now started during the 5th century so that we can resist the strange ideas that come to us from outside that would mess the whole faith. To know how dangerous this heresy is, Nastur had some monasteries in some other areas close to the... Uh, Arab Peninsula, and from these areas and monasteries came out this idea. Is it clear? This is why who study the other ideas would find out that sometimes our brethren, those they see Christ as a, a human being, and sometimes they elevate him above humans, because the origin of that story was Nastor. Did you understand anything, or? because the origin was Nastur so the programming went on like that so you would find that some things are very clear that he's a regular man and some other places texts say that he is above all humans because this is the teaching of Nastur in the beginning that shows us the danger of heresies and how they can lead to and the greatness of councils because they determine things and this is what we got he exalt you the mother the mother of light true light and we glorify you the mother of God the virgin because you gave birth to the savior of the world that text was put in the Council of Ephesus, so the decree of faith was fulfilled during those three uh, councils. Since then, nothing was added to that decree. So all the ancient churches and all their prayers, they have to say these things. That's why we say that in the Agbe every day, we say we exalt you and truly we believe in one God, even in uh, the wedding matrimony. Our ceremony, we have to make sure that it's an orthodox faith. They say, truly, we believe one God before baptism, even in funerals. When the person leaves safely, we are making sure, are you with us or not? Truly, we believe. So you are going the right track. So the, our church, in all her prayers, has to review this decree or this phrase, starting from we exalt you up to the, we uh, wait for the uh, resurrection of the dead. Well, let us say him now. Our theme is lift up your hearts. Like we are focusing on prayers and prayers, the spirit, because there is prayer sometimes that just by lips, like my the flesh. And yesterday we understood some things related to how one sees himself and how the Lord sees you and how can one draw near to the Lord. Today I want to talk to you about 
ask for or seek the grace because the fathers, when they explain the famous uh, uh, verse for uh, ask and you will get, uh, they put the questions that you always ask. Sometimes we ask and we don't get. So they said you understand you misunderstand the verse. God doesn't mean when you ask for money, you will find money. When you ask for age, you will get age. You ask for uh, the revenge from people, you will get revenge from people. No. But the Lord meant something called grace because the most precious thing that we have in the language of the New Testament is called the Testament of grace. The grace is all the divine gifts. It's Take, they take uh, the word grace, the grace of or the f grace gift. So w all the sense when they said whatever you ask, you take. Maybe you haven't taken what you w wanted, but you are not aware that you got grace. So I will tell you a story. Uh, once a servant told me I was praying, and when I remember any of my children away from the Lord, I would be in tears and I get affected because I was said that he was lost. But the Lord doesn't want to give, get him back. But I found out that after a few months when I pray and remember him, that I drew near to God and that I became different from before. And I felt g real grace, although he didn't come back. But I still ask for something and God is giving me something else that was motivating for my prayers but God wanted me to cry and pray and he gave me something else he gave me grace this is what we are going to understand right now this is why Christ said pray and don't stop praying what if you pray and the Lord uh, responds you will stop praying if you understand don't understand grace but if you know what it means that the grace of God will enter your heart and mind you will never stop prayers because you will be like a thirsty land that wants water all the time you cannot put a glass of water and then the land would tell you I don't want more ask and you will get and you will get grace the words of our Lord Jesus in the text here in Matthew chapter 7 uh, Buna is reading part of the Bible he didn't say he will get what he wants he will get grace again Abuna is reading the text on the screen let's continue that if a child is asking his father, I want bread. Sometimes the father, if he has, he will give bread, he will give bread, cheese and eggs and meat. The child is, is hungry. So if he just asks for bread, he's a father, he will give him more than what he asked for. So here he says, he will. would he give him a stone? Never. Like the Lord can, would not give you less than what you ask for. Maybe he will give you more than what you ask for or something different from what you ask for, but more useful and better for you. Of course, at the time of Christ, fish was the cheapest because they had lakes and the fishermen were, and, and farmers would eat a lot of fish. Would he give him a serpent, like give him something to harm him? Abuna is continuing the text again on the screen. See, he didn't say in the last verse, he said he didn't say, grant what you want. He didn't say so. We'll give you exactly what you asked for. No. But he will generally good things. He, so the Lord, as long as you pray, he will give you uh, good things. Good things for the Lord are not just money or health. These things are cheap. They are for in the old covenant the man in the old covenant he would fo the person would focus on three things long life many children and the abundance of earth that was the most important thing for people who went with God because for them that was the concept of blessing but for us the new uh, covenant people he said forget all about earth and let us focus on the heavenly kingdom the riches of uh, the kingdom is grace the taste of heaven we'll see 
the grace that we get in the in prayers. He would give gifts to those who would ask him. The word grace was repeated not only by St. Paul. He was the most who used it. St. Paul, we finish all the grace of God the Father, but all saints understood grace, and they knew the covenant of grace, or the era of grace. St. Paul says, and the Buddha is reading a, Bible, a verse of the Bible again. Hope rest your hope fully upon the grace. Rest your hope on the grace. If you understand grace, you will go to the Lord and will say, "I want, I don't want anything but your grace. I don't want health. I don't want money. I don't want success. If I get the grace, I have all of these." That would remind you of the prayer of Solomon when he stood to pray. He didn't understand grace yet, but his need as a young person in replacing his father David and the kingdom was so big. He said, I'm so young, give me wisdom, give me an understanding heart that would discern, because it's bigger than me. Wisdom is some kind of grace. Take care of that. Wisdom and grace are the same direction. So Christ appeared to him and he said, I will give you what you have requested, because you requested wisdom or grace, and I, I will give you more above it what you haven't asked for. I will give you riches, will give you kingdom, and will give you success, and so and so and so, because the rest is, would be given to you. It's all that we should change in our prayers. And instead of keeping asking uh, materialistic, thi earthly things from God, ask for grace, and you will get everything. You would have heaven and earth. But if you keep asking about earth, and you get it, and you're so happy that God gives you what you want, excuse me, you are foolish then, because you don't understand the Lord, and because you have lost your chance, you keep asking him for something that you want. Let him give you what he wants. It's said that once in the areas, uh, rural areas, a child went and worked in the field, and uh, and he went to the uh, one who gives like uh, wheat for those who worked uh, grains. So that man used to tell him, put your hand and take what you want and go home. That child was so smart and he went to the man and he went to the man before and, and they finished he said put your hand and take whatever you want he said no can you give me with your own hand he said why he said because your hand is bigger than mine you understand the idea <coughs> excuse me so it's the same idea when you want to fill your hand you don't understand your hand would be filled with a small with a with some dust, but let God give you with his own hand and he will give you what he wants and it's different from what you want. Much more abundant of what we think or we ask for. What he wants to give you cannot be compared to what you keep asking for. That's the idea of let us, when we ask to understand God's way in responding to our prayer. St. Paul who lived the concept of grace and he repeated it several times because he was sure that what he had was grace. How come I was a devil and I was blaspheme, blaspheming and I was going to hell definitely? Have, how did I turn to be God's man and make miracles and open churches and write in the Bible? So he said, through God's grace, I'm not myself. And his grace that was given to me was did not was not in vain. I labored more than all of them, but not me. Even though all the grace that he had, there was the grace of God writing the epistle, so he saw it very clear. He said, "I live." in the fullness of God's grace. That's the result of prayers. When we say lift up your hearts, lift up your heart to take grace. Mm, you don't lift up your heart to come out of the divine liturgy with good news that you earned money. You don't understand. Money will come and go, come and go till, you, till it goes uh, totally or you go totally. That's not the matter, but be smart and lift up your heart because when you lift it up, you will take something precious called grace. What is grace then? Grace 
defining it is hard. You can say it's the divine role, like every divine uh, action in your life is called grace. That starts with the breath that you take, your leg when it moves, or a good idea in your heart, or in your mind, or a good thing that you do, your children at home, the money that enters your pocket, everything from God you can call grace. Or in a more accurate way, it's God's work in the human weakness. My strength, this is grace in weakness. It's the one beside the zero. You are and I am, we are zero. But the grace will put one beside you. So if you become two zeros, uh, you would become 100. If you are five zeros, you'd become 100,000. So you add zeros. So if you find yourself more zeros, zero, 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 when the grace would be working more, its value will be more. You understand? That's why they say the humble people, they keep increasing uh, zeros. They feel that they are zero more and more and more. As long as they feel more, the zeros increase and the number would double and multiply because the grace would, the one would make you a billionaire in the language of heaven. So grace here means God's action in weakness. <coughs> the expression that we say in the Divine Liturgy, the grace of His only begotten Son, our Savior, the grace of Christ is all that Christ did for our salvation. Th creation is grace. Because we, we didn't choose to be created, the fact that you are a human being is a grace. The incarnation is, a, is grace. Christ came to our world is grace redemption he died for us is grace the holy spirit that dwelt in our hearts is grace all that is the work of or the action of christ so it's called the grace of our lord jesus our problem my beloved see this grace is like a safety box in our homes that has billions of gifts and blessings some people forget that they have a safety box they forget about this grace so they live uh, like poor as beggars but th this who focuses on himself and his weaknesses is someone who doesn't understand anything. Uh, did, weren't you baptized? Isn't the Lord your Father? He, the Holy Spirit is in you. You are so rich. How come you are rich and you keep begging in the world? Because he focused on the human deficit. Uh, yes, man is weak and inadequate. Like Each of us would lose hope in his own will. Daily, one would hear someone say, I am bored that I promise God. Whenever I promise him, I let him down. When I would hope that my will would get stronger and I pray, well, I do that for two days and then I stop. I promise God to stop sinning and then for one week and then I come back after a week. The will is def deficient or inadequate. It's very physical weakness. Like we hear about saints who would fast for days and watch during the night and we cannot stay for an, uh, one hour fasting. So what's wrong? Where would we go? There is deficit because of problems and hardships. Take care of the deficit in our life. As long as it bothers us, it's the way where the grace appears because my strength would be perfected in weakness. So grace would work more and more with the unable person. So when you have many problems and psychological inadequacy and uh, lack of will and uh, deficiency in because of your frustration in your life, that's a good atmosphere for you to enjoy grace because you will have to open your safety box because you are bankrupt. So good, keep being bankrupt because the pennies that you would spend is nothing compared to the jewelry that are in the safety box. So the Lord a lot, many times would like us to be weak, not to humiliate us, but the Lord wants to awaken us so that we can understand and find out this concept and to live in the era of grace, to become the children of grace, to know how we are rich and instead of that life that we look around themselves, ourselves as poor and needy people. Think with me how many times did you have the feeling that there is no hope, uh, there is no hope in me or there is no hope in my home, there is no hope in this work, there is no hope in change. 
that feeling is where the grace would interfere. How many times did you feel that you failed in everything? How many times did uh, losses surround you from every place, or losses in relations, losses in money, losses in health? Here, uh, seek and you will find. Ask and you will be given. Knock and it will be opened for you. Those who will ask will get you know why we do not pray fervently? Because we haven't been bankrupt enough. When we become so bankrupt, we have to cry. And we knock at the door because there is nothing left. Our dependence on ourselves and our, our abilities and our will make us, when we talk to God, okay, if you have something good, send it. There is nothing, so nothing comes. That's not the way. But when you stand before the Lord and say, I am lost, there is nothing going well. Good, I, I am fed up completely. My soul has become like a land without water. Then the tap would open to the utmost. The real purpose of the prayer, according to the teaching of the fathers, is grace. Or in the language of someone like St. Macarius the Great, he said grace is the fullness with the spirit of God the most precious thing for Christ is his spirit his spirit created the world the Holy Spirit created the whole world so when he gives you from his spirit then you would become richer than anybody else in the world St. Peter says the God of all every grace or all grace who called us for his eternal glory see what grace would do after you have suffered shortly that's the inadequacy. You were uh, oppressed for a while. After you were humiliated, he will perfect you, complete you, and will confirm you, and strengthen you, and enable you. So he will do everything for you. He will do everything. He's the God of all grace. He will work with you and will elevate you and complete all the weakness that you have. The same since St. Paul was in prison and his health was so bad and he sent to Ephesus and there were people outside who were happy that Paul was in prison that if he surrendered to despair he would collapse completely but what is strange inside the prison the idea of grace occupied him the epistles of uh, in prison Galli Philippi, Colossians inside uh, the prison he said I kneel before uh, the Lord Jesus Christ so that he can give you out of his rich glory to be strengthened by his spirit. That's grace. He was praying for his children not to uh, not to have their problems solved and all that. No, no, no. He said, I live in grace that I want you to taste. They say there was a sermon for St. Anthony in the same sense was saying, sometimes I pray for you to taste what I taste in my cell. St. Anthony had many spiritual experiences, the taste of heaven. So he would go to his children, the monks, saying that, telling them, there are things that I cannot tell you, but I pray that God would make you taste what I taste, but it's, it cannot be expressed by words. I cannot say it. See, those people who reach transfiguration and this divine love, they, there are no words to express. They, they would say, I just pray for you so that you would be supported by his spirit, so that the Christ himself would dwell by himself in your hearts. This is why we call it the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So ask and you'll find grace. When you say lift up your hearts, like, sorry, someone like a beggar who is lifting his hand or heart, God, I will not leave you without before you give me grace. I want grace. I don't want anything else. I want to be supported with by your spirit. When your spirit fills me, I have taken everything that I want. This is why Christ said, do not stop praying, because grace is like the ocean. Endless water. John Chrysostom says even, the, he said the uh, simile of the ocean. He said that's limited because the ocean is limited still. He said take from the water like the water of the ocean although the ocean is still limited compared to God's grace. What is grace in detail? What would it give you? 
the idea that you pray fervently, the first grace that you take is the, the grace of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a free grace that is given for all who pray fervently. The sinning woman who was cry weeping at the feet of Christ could not ask for forgiveness. She was only crying. He told her, your sins are forgiven. It's a grace. She didn't ask, but she got forgiveness. The crippled man, he came to Christ and he told him, your sins are forgiven. He didn't ask for it. And those who carried him didn't ask for that. When you come every divine liturgy and, and pray fervently, you will get forgiveness, even if you didn't focus on that word. The second grace is that of righteousness. Right, the righteousness of Christ uh, would dwell upon you. The perfection of Christ, the holiness of Christ. The, so when you pray fervently, the image of Christ will be printed uh, or reflected on you. That's called the grace. So you would have some kind of light with the prayer. The grace of power when you are defeated, uh, frustrated, and you come out of the prayer with a strange strength that you didn't have, the grace of will. Th will would be born in, uh, in, in your heart. Some of you for sure try that they don't want to do something, and after praying well, they would have the desire or the appetite to do it, like services and things like that. The grace would generate in your heart good will so you would have uh, good things that you want to do the grace of change like we all complain that we do not change easily that's a lack of prayers if we pray more we'll get more grace and the change will be easier when you stand before the Lord and ask him for grace he likes to give grace and the grace will give you will change in you will make of you an image that is uh, different from your nature this is the truth that we f sometimes forget and we keep focusing on other things. The grace of f forgiving. M one cannot forgive people who wronged him easily. And when the uh, sin, the mistake is very big, it's almost impossible. But what do you think when you ask for God's grace, you would find coolness in your heart and strange peace and love for your enemy. From where did this come? It's called the grace. Can anyone love his enemy or can he forgive someone who hurt him? It cannot work, but through God's grace, of course you can. The grace of speech. You don't know how to say two words, but God would give you grace to talk and you say useful words or you say the, the words that should be said. The grace of decision. Many major decisions, one is confused about them in his life or about his children or service. This needs, this needs grace. So the Lord would give grace and you'd find that you have said sound healthy words and from where that's called grace or wisdom the grace of understanding that you understand what the Lord wants from you you understand the Bible you understand God's will in your life all that is called the grace you tell me I don't know how to ask for all of that do not ask for anything just tell him Lord and you would find the grace pouring and it will give you the, doc the good doctor in heaven, he knows what you need more than yourself. If you need forgiveness or understanding or forgiving or change or freedom or will, all this will come. So as long as we pray fervently, we will get grace more and more. Even the media or the sacraments, the role of the church is the field that would facilitate for you to enjoy grace. Baptism and myron uh, are grace. You were born in Christ by grace and the Holy Spirit dwelt in you through grace. Confession and repentance are grace. Communion is grace. The Eucharist is grace and you are attached to Christ and so you, end, you, you go to eternal life. This is why we call it the media of grace. We want to get used to pray, Lord, give me grace. It's very easy when you pray before you ask for earthly things just ask for grace so St. Paul says praying for us so that God would open for us a path for, to talk that's the grace if God doesn't build the house in vain the builders are working building the house is grace stability of houses is grace the houses need prayers if they pray well 
don't tell me the man's education is so or the woman is like that it's believe me a crisis of prayer if people pray well and out of their heart there would be no home that would be lost or a child that would be lost the devil will not be able to kidnap from a house that is guarded by grace but if the God doesn't guard through his grace the house people it's in vain for people to get I have a father, he was crying. He said, I brought up the children in the Sunday school and I was good with them at home. I traveled because I was a little bit busy. Would they be far from that? Why? They need prayer. They need grace. Whatever you do with your own hand, you cannot save your children. God's grace only can change them. So ask for the grace. And grace above grace. So the Lord wouldn't give with so when you ask he will not tell you I gave you yesterday are you greedy? No he becomes so happy by the greedy people in grace for grace who are hungry and thirsty for grace blessed are they they will be fulfilled so nobody would tell him I want like yesterday and then Christ will tell him I, it's enough that you got yesterday God likes to give his grace the last point grace likes humility or humbleness the logo of grace remember those three words the humble would find grace why did our mother the virgin is called full of grace she is on the top of the human pyramid because she was so humble so with her humility she had grace above every grace so you want grace to increase be a disciple all the time like obedience is good for humility the one who wants to learn is a humble person he will get grace the person who repents a lot and says Lord have mercy he will get grace this is why saints were busy with the prayer of Jesus it's not a, a, like a magic it's the Jesus prayer is an expression of a heart that wants that seeks grace Lord Jesus uh, have mercy on me sinner that will give you give you grace humility when you are ashamed of yourself will give you more grace like repetition like asking the Lord a lot will end with exercise in every prayer or every divine liturgy let us learn when you stand to pray before you ask for anything for yourself or your home or your problems tell him Lord at the beginning and the end I want grace give me grace and then whatever you want it, it, of grace it's up to you I need everything whenever you read the Bible it's also say Lord give me grace to understand what do you want to tell me these words would bring things but it doesn't bring anything of me something wrong I want grace to understand what you, you're saying in every decision yet you say don't rush and talk just lift up your heart and tell him Lord give me grace and of course that uh, quest request makes God happy because he is the God of all grace in every service say Lord give me grace in their eyes those people I'm going to visit or talk to I want grace because it's not going to work through my smartness in every hardship tell him Lord give me grace to keep my peace whatever the hardship or the problem tell him I want grace to keep peace glory be to the Lord forever and ever Amen <laughs>